I am Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, two efforts to recall Mayor Bob Filner have been combined into one. We'll hear from the leaders of the drive. Also tonight, the struggle between border security and concerns for the environment and the fence standing between them. And we'll show you how a San Diego company is trying to bring 3D printing to the masses. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hello, good evening. Thanks for joining us. San Diego's city attorney is threatening to sue the mayor's chief of staff if she doesn't turn over memos related to sexual harassment claims against Bob Filder. Lee Burdick has refused so far, claiming they fall under attorney-client privilege. Jan Goldsmith's office says she is not Filner's attorney and is actually a witness in the case. Goldsmith is giving Burdick until the close of business Monday to turn over the documents. There were two separate campaigns to recall the mayor today, but organizers announced they are joining forces. They will now move forward with one coordinated effort to recall the mayor. KPBS reporter Claire Trageser joins us from the News Center with the update. So, Claire, who's running the recall effort now? Well, it's a pretty unlikely cast of characters. Michael Palomari, a land use consultant and registered Republican who ran the only successful recall effort in San Diego's history. Then Stamp Corbin, the publisher of LGBT Weekly, who has been painted as a Filner supporter, but that's a claim he denies. And Elisa Brent, who describes herself as a housewife who started the RecallBob.com website. The city attorney's office has said that Corbin and Palomari's recall campaigns could be run simultaneously, but the separate sets of signatures could not be combined at the end. Here's Stamp Corbin. That was a clear signal to us that we needed to bring both campaigns together in order for the citizenry of San Diego to be able to have its say. So where do we go from here with the recall? Well, they're going to be recruiting volunteers to collect signatures and also probably hiring signature gatherers. Corbin has previously said he was against using paid petitioners, but now he's on board with it. And Palomari said since they have to collect more than 102,000 signatures, they will need hired help. When you get a lot of volunteers, there's a lot of energy, but hardworking people, men and women, work every day, and they can't be there at 3.30 on a Tuesday in front of a Walmart. So as any initiative proceeds, there are paid signature gatherers. Mayor Filner has until August 11th to respond to their recall petition. People can then begin collecting signatures on August 18th. KPBS reporter Claire Trageser. Here's more on the recall process. As Claire just said, the mayor has until August 11th to respond to the recall notice. And signature gathering can start as soon as August 18th. The group has until uh, September 26th to collect and turn in over 100,000 signatures. Then the city clerk has 30 days to verify those signatures. If they are verified, the petition goes before council, who will then schedule a special election within 60 to 90 days. Another San Diego business group is calling on Filner to step down. The Port Tenants Association says the, mayor, the mayor's admitted conduct is hurting the local economy because of an uncertain business climate. The group's president, Sharon Bernie Cloward, is one of the women who actually accused the mayor of unwanted advances. And a ninth woman has come forward to accuse the mayor of touching her inappropriately. Emily Gilbert is a Marilyn Monroe person impersonator. She told Fox 5 San Diego he groped her at a fundraising event following his election last year. She wants Filner to make a donation to a women's cause. Five national Republican committees issued a joint memo today blasting Democrats over the scandals of Filner and New York mayoral candidate Anthony Weiner. The memo says, quote, Democrats want voters to think they'll do anything to defend women, but said nothing when women were allegedly harassed by Filner. The memo also says Democrats created the war on women debate in last year's election and says it's now backfired. Of course, you can find all of our coverage of the controversy surrounding the mayor on our website at kpbs.org slash news slash Filner. 
And what happens next will actually be a major topic at Voice of San Diego's PolitiFest, co-sponsored by KPBS. It's tomorrow from 10 to 2 at Liberty Station in Point Loma. You can join the discussion about San Diego's future and more. The U.S. Supreme Court has refused to delay the release of thousands of inmates from California prisons. The justices denied a stay requested by Governor Brown. He's fighting a federal court order to reduce the prison population by about 10,000 by the end of the year. The attorney for the inmates says the uh, decision is significant because it appears the state was gambling everything on the delay. This was a very serious stay application. They raised all their arguments. They filed hundreds of pages of documents. They used specially hired Supreme Court counsel at over $1,000 an hour to raise these arguments. Three judges ruled in favor of the stay. The order to reduce the prison population actually was issued in 2009 after overcrowding created unconstitution, unconstitutional health conditions. Brown says the state has already reduced the prison population enough to address the problem. He says any further reductions would jeopardize public safety. The head of the state prison system met today with advocates for inmates on a hunger strike. They've been refusing to eat for nearly a month to protest conditions in solitary confinement at Pelican Bay. The advocates were positive after today's meeting. They say Jeffrey Beard listened to their concerns and their ideas for ending the hunger strike. The national unemployment rate is at four and a half, is at a four and a half year low, falling today to 7.4%. Actually, that covers July. Employers added 162,000 jobs, fewer than expected. California's unemployment numbers are expected next week. 2012 was a good year for many San Diego farmers. A report from the Farm Bureau says the value of local crops went up 4%, and there was an increase in the amount of land used for farming, the biggest slice of last year's crop, plants, and trees for landscaping. And a warning tonight, Americans traveling overseas are being urged to take extra precautions. The U.S. is issuing a global travel alert. Citing an al-Qaeda threat, State Department has closed 21 embassies and consulates this weekend in the Muslim world. This embassy closure is significant. Uh, we have not seen a level of embassy closure like this for some time. It is not the first time that our embassies have been threatened overseas or that there's a perceived threat, but clearly it's an indication that the administration is taking seriously uh, it's the chatter that it's collecting, that it's hearing about. Americans are vulnerable overseas, inherently vulnerable. We're vulnerable here, too, but when you're overseas, it does stand out more. PBS NewsHour will have more on this reported threat and how the U.S. is responding coming up tonight at 7. The warning comes as San Diego Congressman Scott Peters announced a week-long trip to Israel. He'll be part of a congressional delegation meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. Congress is considering building hundreds of miles of new fencing along the U.S.-Mexico border as part of immigration reform. From our front terrace desk, Joe Replogo reminds us of the last big fence-building push and its potential effects on San Diego's fragile border ecosystems. It's a clear, breezy morning on the scrubby hills overlooking the Tijuana River Valley. Border Patrol jeeps cruise the dirt roads that switch back up and down the hills along the border fence. Mike McCoy knows this corner of the country well. The 71-year-old veterinarian has spent more than half his life working to protect the estuary formed where the Tijuana River's fresh water meets the salty Pacific Ocean. We're going down toward Smuggler's Gulch. This is probably the, the most uh, difficult cut for them and the most problematic cut for us. By us, he means the environmentalists and local land managers who vigorously fought against the massive earth-moving project, which in 2009 filled in the deep gulch and built a road across it in the name of border security. Before, it was going down these switchbacks. 
and that took a long time. This way, they just fly right through here. By they, McCoy means Border Patrol agents scouting the area for illegal smuggling. Starting in the 1990s, this place became ground zero in the battle over how to secure the border against illegal immigration and drug trafficking. Back then, hundreds of illegal crossers swarmed down the hills nightly from Tijuana. Then 9-11 happened, and concerns mounted about terrorists coming in through porous borders. As a result, Congress ordered a fence built across 700 miles of the southern border, in addition to San Diego's fortified triple fence that was already planned. Opponents of the fence here had slowed construction down for years through public outcry and lawsuits. Frustrated, Congress passed legislation giving the Department of Homeland Security the right to waive all legal requirements in order to expedite construction. And that removed uh, a major tool of environmentalists and others opposed to the construction. And it um, really removed many of the requirements for an open process, for public hearings, things that citizens uh, and communities and environmentalists had fought for. Uh, really from the 70s. Since then, Homeland Security has waived close to 40 federal laws and countless state laws to build new sections of fence all across the U.S.-Mexico border, some of it across federally protected areas and habitat for endangered and threatened species. Now there's talk in Congress of adding 700 new miles of fence along the southern border and giving Homeland Security even more power to waive laws to build it and other border infrastructure. Border Patrol refused to grant an interview for this story, but Sean Moran, vice president of the Border Patrol Union, says fencing is generally just a speed bump. The fence really hasn't cut down on uh, human smuggling because if you build a 20-foot fence, uh, the smuggling organizations, they just build a 21-foot ladder and they get the people over it. But Moran says the contentious San Diego fence was needed. Illegal traffic here has slowed to a trickle. It's moved to Arizona and Texas. And Moran says adding hundreds of miles to the U.S.-Mexico border fence would probably help agents by funneling illegal traffic into areas they can control. It's not the answer to border security, but it is a primary tool that the Border Patrol has to slow down things. Mike McCoy admits the impact hasn't been all bad. Illegal crossers used to tromp through sensitive areas here, and he does understand the need for a secure border. I just think that we could have done better with another approach, biologically and ecologically, than what we did with this approach. What really rankles McCoy is the supreme trump card held by one federal agency, the Department of Homeland Security. It's kind of my way or the highway type thing, and that's not the way America worked to me. We all had a say in what, what went forward. As this year's debate over immigration and border security gets louder, environmental concerns are barely a whisper. Jill Replogle, KBBS News. Sergeant Lawrence Hutchins says he wants out of the Marine Corps. He's speaking out for the first time since his murder conviction was overturned in an Iraqi war crime case. But he has to stay until the Navy decides whether to appeal his case to the U.S. Supreme Court. Hutchins led an eight-man squad in a 2006 attack in Hamdaniya. A retired Iraqi police officer was killed. Hutchins says he thought the man was an insurgent leader while he waits for the Navy to decide his fate. Hutchins is back at his old job as a marksman instructor at Camp Pendleton. A first for the Navy in San Diego, the USS Boxer has deployed with a complement of Ospreys. It's the first West Coast ship to do so. The tilt rotor Ospreys will eventually replace the Sea Knight helicopters used by the Marine Corps since Vietnam. The latest in the Bob Filner sexual harassment scandal and a student forgotten for days in a federal lockup gets a multi-million dollar settlement. I'm Mark Sauer. Join us for these stories and more tonight at 8.30 on the KPBS Roundtable. A San Diego author takes her young kids on a cross-country road trip through 19 states. She not only lived to tell about it, she wrote a book. Peggy Pico recently talked with her about the adventure. Summer road trips are a tradition for many families, but life on the road with kids is not as simple as it sounds. A classic episode of The Simpsons sums it up this way. Are we there yet? No. 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 Are we there yet?
Now that's just one of the questions asked and answered by my guest, Gretchen Bruner, in her new book, The Road Scholars Lessons from the Scenic Route. Gretchen, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Three kids, three months. 10,000 miles in 19 states. There's one question to ask. Why? Why? Ah, it's a great question. Um, adventure was what I thought I went for. What I found that was, was far, far more than that. Uh, the trip was a life-changing experience for all of us. So. And, and this book came out of it. Tell us some of the highlights of the best of of this trip. For sure, all the national parks. But um, bigger than just the location was the connection that I got with with myself, with the kids, with our country, with people that we met on the road. Yeah, a whole lot of a lot of layers in your book. Yes. I, I definitely noticed this. Um, I read that on day two of your trip, you cut off a couple of semi trucks, desperately yeah. trying to get over to the side of the road because your fuel pump broke and you were losing acceleration. Yes. Uh, everything came out okay with that. Everything one. came out okay, but of course, you know, that was just day two, and I anticipated that there would be a breakdown, but I never thought it would be that soon into the trip. Uh, thankfully, we got off to the side and got towed and everything turned out okay. But you but had some other obstacles too. That was just the beginning, right? Right. We broke down a couple different times mechanically, but you know, it's an emotional trip. As you mentioned earlier, traveling with kids is not always, you know, smooth sailing, but um, we've, we found our groove and it all seemed to sync up. You admit to making some mistakes during this trip, of course. Uh, give us a few examples of how you handled it and how your kids responded. Uh, one of them is I, I'm a planner and I didn't, you know, plan to be flexible. And this kind of trip really needs flexibility because the unknown happens. And I think in the beginning I was telling the kids it's all part of the adventure and that became kind of our motto. So the, the lesson in that was, you know, plan for the unknown. The, um, the, unplanned. the unplanned, yeah, exactly. And they responded okay. Let's say you have yeah. a road rage or something. I think they were at, okay. at the end they kind of thought it was a joke. Like, yeah, I know, mom, it's all part of the adventure. But <laughs> they they actually became quite accustomed to it. And they were great travelers. Oh, good. Now your book is sort of a road trip uh, kind of primer for parents, but it has some unusual chapter titles: follow your heart and uh, progress. Not or uh, progress, not perfection. What kind of lessons there are you trying to pass along? What I realized when we got back, the, the road trip wasn't just a, you know how to take a road trip. These lessons were, were life lessons we just happened to learn on the road. So progress, not perfection, is a reminder for all of us that you don't come out of the shoot doing it right the first time. It often takes you know two or three times, and to keep trying. And it's okay because you learn along the way. And it's okay because you learn along the way, exactly. Well, I know there's a lot of uh, practical tips in the book, too. Mm -hmm. um, give us a couple of them as far as your top three, maybe, for taking a road trip with uh, children. Uh, for sure is to, again, be flexible. Uh, second would be to allow them to take part in the planning so that they have an idea of what's in store for them so that they're excited about it. And then the, the third tip would be to um, space out your, your days of driving versus sightseeing so that you're not just always driving because that can be old for everybody. Right, it gets tiring. Yeah. And it's a small little space everybody's involved in. Your number one advice to people planning a road trip uh, with children? Uh, enjoy the road. And, and I mean that by that becomes your reality show. So don't, don't plan to have them do screen time the whole time because I think it really distracts from what they can learn on the on the on the trip oh, okay. itself. Okay, so don't just keep plugging in movies yeah, to keep to, them quiet. Yeah, to unplug them because that's that was part of the fun for us. Okay, well, definitely interesting. I want to uh, thank you, San Diego author, mom, and road warrior, uh, Gretchen Bruner. Thanks so much. Thank you. We recently showed you how 3D printers can be used to create different things from medical devices to works of art. Now, a San Diego-based company is bringing 3D printing to the masses with hopes of spurring innovation and expanding the service nationwide. With 3D printer technology, Thomas Edison would have been able to create the light bulb with fewer tries. Now, inventions in your head, or even on a piece of paper, can be quickly transformed into a plastic prototype. Then our graphic designer will take that idea off of the paper and make it a file, which this machine can then print, and then they get their device, which they can go find funding or actually go into production and begin to sell this to us. Burke Jones is owner of the UPS store in Claremont. It's the first in the country to offer 3D printer service to consumers, small businesses, and startups. The costs can vary from $35 for a small belt clip to five or six hundred for a life-size femur model. It depends on how much support material it takes and how much 
uh, actual plastic it uses. The 3D printer isn't much larger than a microwave oven, but UPS stores are betting it does big things to create more businesses. Tracy Mark says the San Diego company is expanding the service into five other cities nationwide. So San Diego has a lot of entrepreneurs, small businesses, and it's a huge market for tech. Um, there's a lot of techies everywhere, and they have so many ideas, and you know, who knows, we might have the next, you know, millionaire just waiting to happen, getting their idea out there. At nearly $21,000, the 3D printers aren't the kind you'd purchase for home use, so providing the service to customers is a big step toward making it available to all consumers. I'm Jeffrey Brown. On the next news hour, the latest jobs numbers and what they say about the health of the economy. It's Friday on the PBS News Hour. Preseason for football. Chargers are getting ready to host Fan Fest tomorrow morning at Qualcomm Stadium. Peggy Pico recently sat down with sports writer Jay Paris to talk about the upcoming season. This year's Charger training comes with a lot of expectation as the team picked up a new GM, coach, and a few high-profile players. San Diego sports writer Jay Paris joins me with some inside observations on what we might be able to expect this year. Welcome back, Jay. Thanks for having me. Now, the Chargers have some new blood, as we just heard. Um, how are things looking uh, so far? Uh, you know, so far, so good. Uh, last time I checked, they're undefeated. <laughs> Anytime <laughs> you can say that, you're doing pretty good. But th there's, a, there's a turning of the page out there in the organization with uh, Tom Telesco, the new general manager, Mike McCoy, the, the new coach, uh, both rookies in, in those positions. And, you know, the Norv Turner, A.J. Smith there is gone. And, and you, could, you can sense that out there now. Uh, you know, new faces in the front office and a lot of new faces on the field as well. In the last three years, as you're kind of bringing up with these names, it might sort of conjure up sort of a painful time for the uh, Charger fans. What's been missing from the team that uh, has kept the Chargers out of the playoffs? I think there was a, a, a roster drain of talent, and, and mm -hmm. they certainly had a talented team two, three years ago, and it seemed like instead of taking steps forward from that, they kind of took a few back. And while they were taking those steps back, the expectations kept going up with it. And uh, you know, the last couple of years have been disappointing. And Chargers, you know, last year was the first losing season since 2003. So, you know, the, the Charger fans weren't used to losing years, and uh, now they're hoping they get back on track. Well, we're looking at some video of some of the uh, training going on. Um, I've heard some praise for Telesco's new draft pick. So wh where is that coming from? Well, uh, they had to fix the offensive line. The guys up front, the big uglies, as we call them, that have to protect Phillip Rivers. And he did that with his first-round pick, uh, D.J. Fluker from the University of Alabama. He'll be playing right tackle. And the guy with probably the biggest name out there is Notre Dame linebacker Manti Teo. Uh, he's got a story on and off the field, and, and the right. Chargers are more concerned about that story on the field. And, and by all accounts, he, he's fitting in just fine. Yes, tell us just a little bit about... Uh, well, he was involved with the Invisible Girlfriend hoax right. and, uh, you know, all the, the baggage that came with that. And uh, you would think that might uh, hold him back, but he's got that big Polynesian smile that, that uh, we all know, and, and he's working hard and keeping his head down and staying in his lane. And, and more than anything, the veterans have, have commented how hard he's working. And uh, he's trying to make Moving up for it, it by being in the weight room, being in the film room, and so far, so good. Okay. Uh, what uh, other players uh, should we keep an eye on this season? I think you got to look at that offensive line. That's going to be the key. Four new out of the five offensive line guys, four new guys are going to be playing in new spots. And also, uh, you always got to look at number 17, and that's Phillip Rivers. And he's entering his 10th season, and he's had a couple subpar years, and uh, he needs to bounce back as well. Well, you know, it's very early. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's very early to make this prediction, but what do you say the chances are of them making it to the playoffs this uh, year? I think that'd be a, a bit of a stretch. Uh, they're playing in a, the AFC West division with the Denver Broncos and Peyton Manning. The, the Broncos have kind of separated themselves from the rest of the division. Uh, Chargers, seven or eight wins would probably be a good, good year for them considering all the changes. That might be a little short of making the playoffs, but might get them going in the right direction. Uh, do you have an update on the stadium? Uh, I, I won't be the one writing the check. I'll tell okay. you that right now. Okay. But they're still looking at the East Village location. That's still the place they're pointing toward. All right. San Diego sports writer Jay Paris, thanks so much for the update. I uh, appreciate it. We'll see a little bit of warming this weekend. Temperatures in the mid to upper 70s along the coast. 80s for the inland valleys and the same for the mountains. Triple digits in the desert. Recapping tonight's top stories. 
San Diego City Attorney is threatening to sue the mayor's chief of staff if she doesn't turn over memos related to sexual harassment claims against Bob Filner. Lee Burdick has refused so far, claiming they fall under attorney-client privilege. Jan Goldsmith's office says she is not Filner's attorney and is actually a witness in the case. Goldsmith is giving Burdick until close of business Monday to turn over the documents. Also tonight, the leaders of two efforts to recall the mayor are joining forces. Now there will be only one petition drive. Filner is scheduled to enter a therapy program on Monday. And the federal government has put out a global travel alert in response to a threat to American embassies and consulates in the Muslim world. Twenty-one of those facilities have been closed. And the U.S. Supreme Court is refusing to delay an order for nearly 10,000 inmates to be released from California prisons this year. The early release is intended to improve prison conditions. Governor Brown says it will jeopardize public safety. You can find tonight's stories and download the KPBS app all on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great weekend.